Hello and welcome back to the Welsh Premiership video podcast. Uh, this is our fifth episode now, uh, after the previous episode with the likes of Kerry Sweeney and Josh Turnbull. Today we're joined by former RGC, Glen Eppley and Scarlett player, Billy McBride. So, Billy, how's lockdown going? Uh, how have you been coping? Thanks, boys. Um, no, it's been good. You know, it's obviously been a frustrating time uh, for everyone in the rugby circle, but um, for me personally, it's been nice to spend time with the family. Um, family time that we've never had together really. Um, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it's all been all sunshine and rainbows here, but it's been nice to spend some quality time. Um, yeah, just now I'll keep my head on. Um, yeah, like everyone else really, uh, waiting for that call from when we can start playing. And obviously it's recently been confirmed you've got, um, you're moving on now to the English Championship and to Doncaster Knights. Uh, how did that move come about and what are you most looking forward to about playing up there at Castle Park? Yeah, it's a bit of a strange, uh, strange one, really. I had, a, I had a message off Instagram of um, Keir Lane, which was an ex, um, ex Cardiff backs coach, um, who had obviously been coaching against me for a few seasons, and he messaged me saying that a good friend of his was going to be director of rugby up there, which was Steve Bowden, and he was one, he was looking for a for an outside half, uh, and he put my name forward and hoped he didn't mind. And I said, no, no, there's no problem with that. And within a couple of hours, um, Steve had messaged me asking for some more clips, um, sent it through and within about 48 hours I'd um, been offered a contract. So um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite a random one, um, but obviously I'm um, you know, very grateful to uh, Theodore and Steve for giving me the opportunity um, and I'm just, you know, buzzing to get, get up there, get started, to be a fresh challenge, new opportunity for me to, to show what I can do in a different league. Uh, Billy, you had two years with RGC. How did you feel those two years went? Yeah, I, personally, on a personal note, I think it was two years of um, of playing consistent rugby for me. Um, I think that's what the Welsh Prem has given me and RGC. I'm, I'm very grateful um, to everyone up there. You know, I played 50 games, started 50 games without, without really coming off the pitch and they were consecutive games. So, you know, last 50 games of you know, making decisions under pressure, week in, week out. Um, so it was, you know, from a playing point of view, that's experience I'm never going to get back. And, um, you know, it's just benefited me in ways that, you know, out of training, out of lifting weights, out of running, um, that making decisions under pressure, um, week in, week out, as I said, has benefited me. And uh, in January of this season, uh, Matt Silver stepped down as head coach. How much of an impact did that have on the squad this year? Yeah, it was a bit of a strange one, really. Um, you know, Matt only spent maybe um, two months with us. Um, obviously, he took a step back for for personal reasons, but we'd gone a couple of weeks pre-season without the head coach, really. Um, and then Matt was only there for a small space, a small chunk of that season. Um, but it was the same faces, you know, with regards to around the coaching group um, outside of Matt and the playing group as the season before. So, um, you know, it, the impact was when Mark and Phil left, um, you know, obviously left um, a, a big hole and shoot big shoes to fill. Um, but from a playing perspective, um, it was the same group of players, the same sort of values, the same um, core group there then, um, which... We felt like, you know, there was a, maybe a change of emphasis of us playing for each other. Um, and when Matt left, it was definitely the case of we had to sort of stick together, stick tighter than usual. Um, and for a large chunk of the season uh, and large parts of the games that we did win, uh, did win and came down to the wire was because of, you know, the tightness of that group. And uh, I think your target for the season was to finish in the top six and you finished a point outside in seven. So how do you feel the season went as a whole? Yeah, you know, it was it was hard really because of um, how well Cardiff were playing um, and everyone was trying to chase them from the start really. Um, but, you know, on a personal level, um, the season was good for myself because of, you know, I had a good run of games again. Um, you know, I scored a, scored a couple of points. Um, but, you know, I think that's maybe, we, we were a bit unlucky with some games, but... We were knocked with a couple of injuries, um, which sadly we couldn't really fill the shoes um, of those players. But it was an experience for them, young boys to come in and experience some, experience some senior rugby, especially going to the likes of you know Sardis Road and 
the wound um, for those young boys to get that experience playing against you know some ex-pros really um, it'll be good for them moving on and it'll only benefit the RGC as a whole and you finished this season as the top point scorer in the league by quite a distance how's this rate amongst your achievements there <laughs> yeah it's, it's up there um, you know as I said it's not about me, it's about the team, but, you know, it's always nice as a, as a fly after you're kicking your goals. Um, not only that, scoring a few tries as well. Um, yeah, but as I said, I would have I would have traded that in to finish in the top, uh, uh, finish on top of the league for, for sure. Um, but no, it was always nice to write that on the CV. Um, but yeah, I would have traded that to, to win the league or, or the cup, definitely. <clears throat> So obviously you played in the Premiership for a few seasons and you've played in other competitions like the British and Irish Cup for the Scarlet A team. Um, what's the main difference in standard between the Premiership and competitions like that? Yeah, it's the main difference for me is uh, you get some games in the Premiership where they are sort of close to professional standards. Um, you know, you come up against teams like Cardiff, Merthyr, where there's a lot of ex-pros there, do you know what I mean? They've got a lot of experience in their belt. You know, I've seen you interview someone like Kerry Sweeney last week who's who's had, you know, 30-odd Welsh caps as well. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's an experience playing against boys like that and they boost the standard of the game. Um, again, um, the British-Irish Cup, I'll never forget us going down as a Scarlet A-side. We've managed to reach the, the quarter-final, the semi-final. Um, we went down to Ealing where we'd had a couple of good results on the, along the way. Beat Nottingham twice, uh, beat Richmond. Um, Beat Leinster home, lost them away, and then we lost really, you know, heavily in Ealing. It was 80 odd points against the Scarlets. But the main difference there was, I think, you know, they were a team which was settled and played together, whereas the Scarlets A side at the time were, you know, we trained together, but not really, you know, uh, the competition as a whole for the Scarlets then was sort of in and out, in and out, where we was fit for the weekend, went to play for the Scarlets then. If not, you dropped out. But that, I think that was that was a good test for for us. I loved that competition. You know, going to places like Leinster away and playing against um, someone like Jack Conan, um, who's gone on to play for Ireland and started for Leinster now. You know, it's, a, it's an experience playing against boys like that, and you learn some very harsh lessons along the way. Yeah, um, who is the best player you've played alongside in the Premiership? Oof, um, that's a tough one. I got, uh, I got two that come to mind. Um, when I was at Llanelli, um, I'd say either Jordan Williams or um, Josh Adams. You know, see what, what Josh is doing now. Um, I'd probably say him because, you know, he was he top try scorer in the World Cup, yeah. starting one of the first names on Team Street for Wales now. You know, he's gone away um, and he's come back. You know, I'd probably say him. And he's got that, you know, down to earth nature about him as well, which uh, a lot of people can relate to. And then finally, what's your best memory of playing in the Premiership? Oof, um, probably the start of last season, beating Merthyr at home, I'd say. Um, I've got a couple of good ones with Lethe. We beat Ebu Vale the first game of the season after they won the league for that season. But I think this year, because Merthyr had gone three times champions to beat them on the opening weekend. Um, that was that was right up there with one of my one of my favourite games for that for sure. You grew up in a rugby family, obviously with your father, Robin, playing for Wales on many occasions. How big was rugby for you as a child growing up? Oh yes, it's, it was huge, you know. Um, you know, there was no pressure f from from my father to for me to play rugby at all, but once I made the decision that I wanted to be a rugby player, then, you know, he sort of supported me as any father would, you know. Um, gives me some advice after games and um, some feedback. But, you know, growing up, I, I think it's, it's the same for any, any young boy in Wales or any sort of village in Wales. Like, the, the rugby club is the sort of the centre of the community, you know what I mean? And especially you in Tumble, um, it was sort of a, a weekly thing. You'd go... You go training on a Wednesday night as a junior. You play on a Sunday. Um, you might do the odd football game, you know, in between. But you know, that was routine, and everyone sort of it was a good community feel, especially in time where we had a really strong junior section. Um, but as you said, growing up in a rugby family, it's there was no real escape from it. As much as my my father <laughs> might say that he didn't put pressure on me, you know, going to see him, 
well, to start playing on Stradley Park and then playing for Wales and then seeing him coach, is you're like, you know, you're itching to be a part of it. And, um, you know, I'm lucky enough now that that I've got the support of, of him. And, um, no, it was, it was a good childhood, you know what I mean? Uh, especially growing up in this area. And as a young boy, did you have many other inspirations that uh, helped the development as a player? Um, well, obviously, obviously my old man for one, and if not, I'd say my mum as well, do you know what I mean? Um, because, and I forget when, when my dad, if you think about it, he was away for Six Nations, summer, autumn, every year. It was my mum that was sort of looking after me, taking me to games, washing my kids, so, you know, she was an inspiration to me as well, uh, and she thinks she knows a little bit about rugby as well. <laughs> um, but no, you know, growing up in Wales, you you want to... You want to follow in the footsteps of someone like Neil Jenkins. Um, you know, you look at overseas, then you got Dan Carter, obviously, you know, best friend that's ever played the game, in my opinion. And then more recently now, you look at someone like, you know, Dan Bigger, um, still at the top of his game. Um, Owen Farrell, you know what I mean? Boys like that. Um, consistent number 10s that I'd grown up watching. And, you know, hopefully someday... Um, be able to achieve, you know, even half of what they've achieved would be, you know, something to, something to be proud of. But some like, yeah, some some of those names, you know, someone like Dan Carter, growing up watching him, you know, yeah. as a twenty year old, twenty one year old, um, coming into the All Blacks team and scoring thirty points against the Lions, you know, that's something, you know, I know a lot of people go on about that, but you know, that's something to look back on. You're thinking, wow, you know, he's probably the best player that's ever lived, you know. And how much are you relishing going up? Well, the chance of going up a player like going Farrell next season? Yeah, yeah. No, it'll be good. It? It'll be interesting. Um, nah, do you know what? They, they've got a lot of big names uh, in their team and everyone's expecting them to go up, straight back up. Do you know what I mean? So, there'll be no pressure on whoever plays against them this year. Um, it'll be an opportunity. That's how I see it. If I get the chance to play against them, you know, it would be nice to go up against two of the best names in world rugby and, you know, put, a, put your foot down, maybe make a name for yourself because, you know, who knows if you were to have a good game against Saracens or a team like Saracens, then it opens up um, shop windows for you left, right and centre there. So, yeah. you know, that's the game I think a lot of boys are itching to play, um, to play against. The likes of Ealing as well, they've made some big signings. Um, so... You know, or I think I speak for most rugby players here where they want to play in the big games. Um, so, yeah, I'll be relishing that if I get a chance. Um, you were part of the 2016 Under-20s Grand Slam winning side. Uh, what was that like, you know, playing alongside so many players who've now gone on to play for Wales at senior level? Yeah, it was it was good, you know. Um, obviously winning the Grand Slam, uh, creating a bit of history there for uh, the junior sides in Wales. Um, you know, and seeing boys like Dylan Lewis, um, Adam Beer, Jared Evans, you know, seeing them moving on, play for Wales week in, week out, you know, to play against, play alongside them and against them all. Um, it was brilliant to be a part of going to the World Cup as well. Obviously, we didn't have quite the same success in the World Cup. Um, but no, that's that's another highlight of sort of my, my career so far, I was winning that Grand Slam, um, creating a little bit of history, as I said. And um, yeah, it was, it was a good sort of, starting block then to moving on to playing senior rugby after that. And you also played sevens for Wales as well. Um, how did that help you grow as a player? Yeah, it was good. It was, it was a real, that was another, um, you know, random one. It wasn't probably quite getting the, the opportunities done the Scarlet. So I thought, I'd ask the question of whether I can use the sevens as a development tool, um, which um, Gareth Williams at the time, the, the head coach was, you know, he was trying to get boys in and get some experience, which was brilliant for me. You know, played alongside some some names there like Sam Cross, um, Lloyd Evans, um, Lloyd Lewis, um, Adam Thomas, boys like that. You know what I mean? And it was a diff completely different, you know, different way of seeing the game. I thought, albeit it's a different game completely, but you know, the values and the the rules are the same. But from a skill point of view. Um, Benefited my kickoffs really, you know. I'd, I'd like to think that's one of my strong points of my game now. Um, benefiting my kickoffs, um, my drop goals, um, you know, my fitness, obviously, speed. You know, you're working with some like Avion Roberts, a condition there is one of the best that I've ever worked with. He really pushes you. And then just being on the seven circuit itself, you know, you're, you're in with some of the stars of the game there. Um, some 
you know, big names and you're playing against like Fiji, which was sort of an eye opener when you come in and playing against Fiji and you're like, wow, you know what I mean? You watch them as on TV as a little boy when they're throwing the ball about, throwing this off road game. And then I remember in one of those games, actually, I made a tackle. I think it was on Jerry Tuai, the, the halfback. I made a tackle on him. I thought, yes, you know, I made a tackle. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I got up and I, the ball was the other side of the pitch and he'd offloaded and I was like, yes, ah, you know what? <laughs> it's just it's just no brain, but that was an experience. I managed to get a Fiji shirt as well, which was which was brilliant. And um no, the Sens definitely helped my sort of physical um my physicality as well as my skill as well, which was a time a period where I sort of maybe lost I lost a bit of bit of love for the game, whereas when I came into the Sevens I sort of, you know, reboosted that and and after I finished Sevens I thought you know, I've done that and now's the time for me to move and play consistent 15 aside rugby because that's ultimately what I wanted to do. So a little bit of fun then to finish. Um, mm. You've had time to mull over the questions, uh, <laughs> the teammates quiz, which has become a bit of a feature of our podcast now. Um, so first question then is, who's the worst dressed teammate you've ever played with? Uh, there's a few, there's a few that come to mind, but um, I've got to say, um, there's a second row that plays for RGC, Bryn Jones. And I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but he used to turn up in his, I know he was straight from the farm. But he used to turn up in his Umbro shoes and jeans, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and his his um, polo shirt to train in all the time. And there's another one then, Elon Rowlands, which is another farmer up in North Wales who used to wear his cap to the side all the time uh, after games. Um, so either one of them too. And who is the best drinker you've ever played with? Oof, best drinker. Um, there was there's a uh, May Parry, I'd say, up in North Wales. May Parry. I'm not saying he's the he's the one that can go on for the longest, but he's the one that buys the usually buys the rounds in. Um, he's quite uh, quite famous up in North Wales for buying power rounds. Um, so I'd have <laughs> to say May. Because you stick by him on a night out, you won't have to pay for anything, you'll just pay, pay for all for you. So, um, <laughs> I'll say, hey, Barry. Not bad. <laughs> uh, who's the change room DJ? Um, well, there's been a few, but I'll go uh, sevens wise. I don't know if you've heard of uh, uh, Lloyd Lou, um, the, the rapper, um, <laughs> but I was playing with him, he was in charge of music all the time. And to be fair to him, it wasn't just you know his rap music, it was all kinds of music he used to facilitate all the boys. So, um, but he was definitely in charge while we were in the gym sessions with the Sevens boys. And who's a nightmare on a night out without throwing anyone too much under the bus? Uh, no, I'm not going to... i got a few stories, but I'm not going <laughs> to say it at all. Um, Avon Badshaw, he's, yeah, he's yeah. quite happy to fight out, um, but he's settled down a, a, a bit now. Um, he's a father, um, so... Um, but back in his heyday, he used to be uh, he used to love a night out, and um, well, he he's he, he comes out now and again. We call him Mad Shaw when he comes out. <laughs> so Mad Shaw, his alter, his alter ego comes out, and um, another one, Evan Yardley. Evan Yardley, Cardiff hooker, now was moved. I was lucky enough to share a house with him last year. Um, he's got an alter ego when he comes out as well. We call him Nave, and uh, he's always good fun. Always a good a good night out when Nave comes out. And lastly then, if you were stuck on a desert island, who's the teammate or ex-teammate you would want to be stuck with? And who's the one you wouldn't want to be stuck with? Um, oh, I would. I'd, I'd have to go with one of the farmers up in North Wales again. Yolo Evans, he'd be handy. Um, good at everything. One of the most naturally gifted rugby players I've ever played with. Another one, Tom Hughes, probably up there, one of the best rugby players I've ever played with as well. Um, either one of them too, because both of them, Tom Hughes, fittest guy I've ever met. Um, he's not going on a bit now, but honest to God, he, I reckon he could go a year without playing rugby, a year without training, and he'll still come back and be the fittest one there. And Yolo, um, you know, he's had a lot of experience, um, proper old school farmer, hard as nails. Um, and I know I wouldn't want to be, there's a, there's a few, there's a list here. Uh, I go Dav Hughes, hooker for Thunder, Reece Scarlets, just doesn't stop talking, talks rubbish all the time. Um, who else is there? Um, oh, Sam Cross as well. Sam Cross, he'd be up there as well because if he gets in a mood, you know, everyone knows about it. Oh. So, Crossy would be up there as well. 
right then that comes that brings the end to our, our fifth episode um cheers for giving up your time Billy and coming on uh, best of luck with your move and hopefully you're back playing sooner rather than later um anybody watching uh, remember to like and subscribe to the channel and follow us on Twitter at our friend pod and we'll see you soon thank you